So I just wanted to ask Joe, um, if you're such a rotational grazing junkie, why are you still set stocking some country? As much as I like to break the rules, um, the blocks of land that we rotate that we don't rotational graze um, are owned by others, and they've said that we're not allowed to, um, either because it's HLS grass or it's parkland that's in front of the, the sort of the big house, and they just want it to be managed in a certain way. I'm always tempted to break the rules, but I'll probably get kicked uh, kicked off if I did. Okay, the gentleman right at the back in the corner. Hi, uh, again, a, a question for Joe. Are you going to offset the nitrogen use? Um, I mean, given the climate emergency, do we, I mean, how, how do you justify the externalities that you're creating by using nitrogen uh, on the grassland? So, yeah, how do I justify using the nitrogen? Um, I'm still not using a vast amount compared to if you're growing something like maize um, or other forage production. And I'm a, probably as tight as they come, so I won't put it on if I feel it's not going to be used or if it's beneficial. Um, I, would, I would use it yeah, when there's financial benefit for using it. My overall ambition of the farm is to make it viable for the future, which means it's financially got to stack up. If I can't make it pay, well, the banks will come and take it off us. So, Yes, we've got to be considerate to the environment because obviously that's a massively important resource that we have as farmers that we've got uh, the privilege to be able to farm the land. Um, but we've got to do it in a manner that is financially viable. And to me, to use it cautiously in the right place will hopefully make the farm more, more viable in the future. Would any of the other speakers like to comment on that? <laughs> so, I mean, I've just comment. I mean, as with everything, um, it, all these sorts of inputs, it's a case of trying to do your best to improve the efficiency with which you're using them. So I think by the sounds of the amount that you're using and, and using it and the way you're using it and not trying your best to only put on the amount that you need and not over applying it, and that's crucial with nitrogen. I mean, do you, because you have herbal layers as well, don't you? I presume you just put it on, do you, do you put it on your um, swords of legumes on, or is it just on the, you, you do? How, how much? Um, yeah, in terms of the volumes that we've put on, so this year I did do some trials um, of up to 200 um, kilos. The plan was to go up to 300 um, on just some trial ground, but when we realised how dry it was, we obviously realised we weren't going to get any benefit from that. Um, yeah, the average we'll be using across the board is six, 60 kilos a hectare, so I still feel that's conservative. Um, but I, I'm also very mindful, as I say, that we've got to make the beef enterprise a contributing factor, um, financially contributing to the farm, to be able to keep running it. Obviously, we see the benefit on the arable side. Yes, we can put those into the partial budgets uh, to help the cause. I guess the Another part that I think is immensely important that can't be overlooked is you've got to get the basics right. Um, whether that be soil sampling so you know where the P's and the K's and, and the sulphur is. You can throw a hell of a lot of nitrogen at it, but if you've just not got your P's and K's in the right place, you may as well throw it straight down the drain. Um, so I think we possibly jump to the conclusion that we're all doing the right thing. And I've had a massive kick up the uh, this year we've been part of the AHDB project because they came and soil sampled all of our grassland. The Little Morton farm was great. We were threes across the board. The Hodsop block, we were ones and twos, which was a little bit embarrassing because I thought we were on, on the ball and soil sampling and making sure we we're doing the right job. Um, so we've, we've got to get the basics right and then we've, we've got to be responsible. I just wanted to uh, come back on that as well. We, we haven't got much data from the, um, the herbal lays yet because they're barely in the ground, but uh, we've been doing some other work on deep rooting cover crops and we've been monitoring the nitrogen that we get, the different 
layers within the soil. So we've been looking at the top 30 centimetres, 30 to 60, and 60 to 90. And um, if we use these very deep rooting uh, cover crops, the sort of species that we're using the herbal lay, we were finding that even if we were putting on quite a high dosage of uh, nutrients, in our case in the form of uh, AD digestate, uh, we were able to measure really very small amounts, even in the, um, the top, middle and the lower layers, if you had the deep rooting species. But if you didn't, particularly in the winter time, uh, then that, that was getting down into the lower layers and that would be beyond uh, any of the, the lower roots and would start to contribute to diffuse pollution. So of course it's, it's not even just a, a waste of money, but if you're in a nitrogen vulnerable zone, then that's uh, going to be increasingly worrying. Okay, um, here's a question for all three of the panel really. Um, when you were talking about the experiments that you were doing on the lays, um, I didn't see any metric for measuring any um, biodiversity impact from them. Is that something you can enlarge on as to whether you are expecting to do that, whether you've seen any data from other experiments and so on? So I'll, I'll start, shall I? Um, yes, we, Lisa uh, Norton from the uh, Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, she will be looking at that in as much detail as she possibly can. And it's, and it's always worth remembering that if you put in a, a, a cover crop or a herbal layer, any of these complex species sets, what you get is going to vary every year. You know, once it's established, then it, uh, it will sort of, it'll, it'll carry on quite relatively structured way, but um, I noticed that the, uh, the herbal lays that we are using, which has got a very large number of, I can't remember the exact number of species, oh, I was going to ask Sam, but I can't see him anymore, um, that, uh, you know, some of those are not going to succeed in the first year, uh, and you're going to get other weed species, if you like, that uh, are present in the, in the seed store. So we're going to be monitoring precisely what comes through. Uh, and how it maintains within the sward, uh, as well as those species that we didn't include. But this last year, when there was that terrible drought, um, I noticed that the, the Cotswold seed set, some of those that uh, had been established during this summer were, were quite reduced in terms of species diversity. Uh, so it's definitely worth keeping an eye on. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, as part of our project, it's not something that we're specifically looking at. I mean, as scientists, we'd have the tendency to build very big projects and measure everything if we were given the opportunity. But, I mean, budgets are limited, so it's not something that we, um, we're including at the moment. But as with these sorts of projects, quite often there's opportunities to add in other things over time. So, I mean, it'd be something that I'd be quite keen to look at adding in the future um, if the right opportunity came up. Can I just say, so there's a project we're doing at the moment that um, Lisa Norton's heavily involved in, the Seed Slip project. Um, so we're working with the Pasture for Life Association on that. And one of the things that we've done is a series of biodiversity, um, quite detailed biodiversity analyses of different pastures. And then there's, alongside that, there's been data collected on their management techniques um, and uh, soil tests and nutrient analyses. So that's data that's just come in and Lisa's starting to look through that at the moment with some of her colleagues um, over this winter and hopefully that the results of that will be released in the next couple of years. And we, we do have a hub for, for seed slip on agroecology, so when we get those results then we'll get those out to people. The gentleman at the front here in the centre. So you mentioned in terms of your rotational grazing, which I'm having been an ex-dairy farmer, a great fan of. Do you believe that, or especially the whole panel, that um, by doing that, you're actually going to drive more organic matter into the into the soils, especially with your your um, like sand? Is that part of the reason you're doing it? And I was also, are you using your your 60 kilograms of nitrogen early in the season to actually drive early growth if you're you know, outside wintering? Yeah, so um, in terms of when we use the nitrogen, yes, we get it on early because our limiting factor will be moisture. So we may as well make hay while the sun shines and get the grass to grow early. Um, obviously, it's going to be way more grass growth than we can graze, so then we'll have to silage it. Or, as I did this summer, when the grass growth starts to drop because of lack of moisture, we can defer graze it. 
Um, the other point to the question, yeah, do I begrudge not grazing, not utilising grass and trampling it back into the ground? Part of me does, yes, because I want to utilise it, I want to put it through the animal, and then I want the animal to put it back on the ground as muck. Um, what I have picked up is the suckler cows are probably better suited for mob grazing where you go into swords with huge um, covers. Um, in a way you can push them a little bit tighter to make them graze what they have trampled. They'll never graze all of it, you'll never be as efficient as, as the, the dairy boys that move every 12 hours. But my concern on the finishers, as soon as you make them go hungry or even get close to being hungry, it limits intakes and it, it limits growth. We're finishing off grass. So I'm very mindful that, that as much as I want to let the swords get bigger and get ahead of me because the benefit for the soil structure, for the rooting depth, and like you say, recycle that nutrition back into the soil, I don't want to do it at the detriment of their growth rates. So. I, I want my cake and I want to eat it. And I wanted to add what we're hoping for from our grazing versus our mowing parts of our study is that uh, we do want to get a feel for um, just how much stimulatory effect uh, the added input of animal and its, uh, its dung but also the, the effect of the animal uh, working some of that foliage into the top layers of the soil what sort of impact that's having on stimulating the soil microbial community. I don't know whether any of you were here for the first session, but one of the speakers talking about that very complex diversity of um, microorganisms that you get on the phyloplane, on the actual surface of the, the plant roots, and you're going to get different complex of species depending on the plant species, uh, and of course in the, in the so-called uh, rhizosphere, uh, all around the... Um, the, the roots of the plant, and so, you know, there, there's, there's a whole extra layer of what's going on in the soil microbial community that we're going to look at as far as we can, um, and I did glancingly note that uh, some of the species that we, that we have in our herbal lay mixture are, for example, mycorrhizal, so you're going to get uh, a very strong mycorrhizal association with some of those species and not with others, and again, you get, you get differences in the type of microbial community that live within the phyloplane and the phyosphere of, of, those, of those different species, so that's uh, quite one to look forward to. We did um, have a field that went into grasses last year that got a bit of a black grass problem in it, and when we started to get sort of May-June time, the black grass started to go to seed, um, so we, we pre graze mowed it and it was getting a fairly strong cover and the cows absolutely loved it so when the dairy guys would probably say you've got to eat that lush green leaf the cows probably by choice like a bit of stalk as well it's just once it's been trampled and pooped on that's when they end up getting the wastage um, they ate every last speck of the mowed grass before they ate underneath the wires which was quite a surprise Just a quick question uh, regarding terminology. When do you speak about lays and when do you speak about cover crops? Has that got anything to do with the length of time um, it stays on or with the mix of species or how do you differentiate? Um, I guess so uh, some of the lessons that we learn from using cover crops which are um, they are used over the winter period to ensure that you've got soil cover. But the, the reasons that we're using them is that we have these complex deep rooting uh, scenarios with the mixtures. So, I mean, a cover crop is a cover crop when you use it as a cover crop. And uh, the same species in a herbal lay is performing a similar duty, but it's not a different species. Yeah, I'd agree that a cover crop, we're, you know, we're growing it between two crops, often usually for a shorter period of time to provide cover. Sometimes we're grazing it, sometimes we're not. Um, a lay is when you're putting down a piece of land um, to a grass or herbal lay mixture, um, usually for a period from one year plus. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd call a, a catch crop is when it's, uh, yeah, a catch crop between other crops, whereas a lay is when it's a full a full season's growth. Um, 
Yes. Dave Stanley, more a couple of comments really. I'm surprised the question is being asked, is grazing preferable to mowing? I thought there were several research papers out there that have demonstrated that there is an interaction between grazing animals, the saliva and the plant there, which results in an increase in overall yield of between, off the top of my head, I think it was 10 to 60 percent. So I just asked the question, why are we going through the same process again? The other one is in relation to a herbal lay mix as opposed to a single species. One would have thought nature just abhors a single species and would try to sort it out. Just the very fact you've planted a wide range of varieties of plants there with changing circumstances, changing soil types. The chances of getting a thriving species or more from a, a, a mixed herb lay has got to be higher, I would have thought. And the final one is in relation to soil organic management. In terms of the measurements there, it's a traditional way of measuring the carbon in the soil, bulk density and all the rest of it. But could I suggest that is arguably a little too scientific. There's a whole range of other benefits that come with improving the soil organic matter, not least of which, of course, is the increase in worms, uh, soil animals, above ground biodiversity. And all of that contains carbon, which of course helps to mitigate climate change. So I don't think we want to be too overly obsessed with just looking at soil organic carbon per se and saying, oh, it's only 0.25% or whatever. I think we look, need to look at the whole carbon cycle and there, the way the soil is delivering on that. Can I just completely agree? <laughs> uh, so I'm not asking the question from the point of view, you know, we have no idea of the answer, but don't forget that this is a full study so if you're an arable farmer um, who has a particular rotation in mind, it may be that uh, it would be nice to have uh, grazing animals on the field, but actually it wouldn't work for whatever reasons. So we're looking to see just how much difference there is. Um, you know, and, if, and if you really don't want any livestock on your farm, will you still get measurable, quantifiable economic benefits that are as close as you can get? So it's, it's a, a series of decisions that we want to take into account. And the same is true, you know, we know that we can get uh, probably more biomass and more interesting soil improvements by using a complex herbal lay, but I've talked to farmers and they say there's no way I'm going to put that on my arable field. I don't know how or whether I'm going to get rid of all those species afterwards, so I'm not prepared to take the risk. And then you look on the other side, you get other farmers who say, well, I'm going to be growing potatoes in that field. Uh, I actually don't want much in the way of grass, uh, so I prefer to try the, the herbal lay and not take the chance of building up um, uh, various pest um, invertebrates in the soil, like wireworms and so forth. So, you know, we're trying to answer as many of the questions as possible with the added economics so that, you know, we can, we can work with something. Um, just to sort of add to Lydia's comments, um, in terms of the, the cut graze question as well, we have, um, when, you, when you're talking about benefits of lays and arable, um, there are some people also asking um, whether they can get those benefits without having to bring livestock onto the farm. So arable farmers are wondering whether they can put land down to um, lays either for grass seed or to then cut the grass and bale it for a neighbour. So there's those sorts of things thinking about as well. Um, what was your second point? Oh, about diverse lays. Um, the, the other thing to sort of, you know, today we focus very much on the soil quality benefits, um, but both the projects that Lydia and I are working on are looking at all, you know, the whole systems approach as well. So, yes, we might be able, we might know the effect on one thing, but it's also answering all those other different questions as well. So, looking at livestock performance, economics, and other issues as well. So, I think you picked up on one that, that we've been asked about as well in terms of the more diverse lays. There's some concern about those species then becoming weeds further on. So, it gives us an opportunity to look at everything together um, and also a platform then to get farmers onto the sites that we're looking at and, and have a discussion about these things. Since you've all gone quiet, I'll just add one other thing uh, about the, sp the complex herbal lays. So we haven't talked about it because we didn't have time, but um, there are some highly beneficial components of these, some of the species that are within these herbal lays. Uh, I, I'll take the sand form for an example because I've worked on it quite a bit. So it's, it's very deep rooting, so it's very uh, good at coping with uh, very droughty, uh, low rainfall situations but it also has a, a very pronounced anthelmintic impact. So if you're um, a neighbouring farmer that might be borrowing a herbal lay, 
if you don't have any livestock yourself, that neighbour can benefit from the anthelmintic impact of species like the samphoin, and uh, doubly, they will benefit from the fact that the worm burden on an arable field will be almost non-existent, and so you get you get benefits across the uh, the landscape. Okay, I know there's loads of things that we haven't really touched on at all, but I think that's probably all we've got time for. Um, so thank you very much to all our speakers for their contributions. And thank you to all of those who've asked questions and all of you here are listening. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>